to ask you, um, if the universe is indeed 13.8 billion years old, how do we reconcile that with the six days of creation according to Genesis? And since Earth time is measured by 24-hour cycles around the sun, what do we make about the days preceding the fourth day? Is this potential contradiction something that we can solve with Einstein's theory of relativity? And on a, and a, and on a semi-related note, where did dinosaurs fit into this picture? Okay. <laughs> if you saw my PowerPoint, that's the last question. It always shows up. Well, what about dinosaurs? Always. <laughs> you, can answer, you can answer everything in the world, but what about dinosaurs? <laughs> Yeah. So uh, for that, I am totally beholden to Ramban, Nachmanides, and to Rashi. <laughs> you know, we're going to say, why not? So first of all, the days are 24 hours each, all of them. How do I know that? I don't know it, except the text says, yom, yom, yom. You know, every day, yom, achai, yom, sheni, yom, sheni. It's always yom, okay? And the Ramban, and Rashi says, it's a Rashi. It's simple as Rashi. It says, yom, kaf, dalet, sheo, day, 24 hours for all of them. So whether there's a sun or not a sun, it doesn't matter. It's still 24 hours. That's the, because the text uses the term day, yom, right? Be erivoga yom echad. Be erivoga yom sheni. So the sun's not mentioned until later. So the sun might have been around, but not mentioned, but let's put that aside. So the Rashi tells us all the day, every yom means day. It's easiest Rashi and all, find an easier Rashi. And then the Ramban comes along, the Ramban, Nachmanides, with the name Ram, the Ramban, comes along and says, not only are they 24 hours each, uh, like the six days of our work week. And that's interesting because a student said, well, maybe the days are 24 hours, but maybe the hours are different. One of the students in my class, I remember, as if he was looking over the Ramban, as if, as if Ramban was looking over his shoulder. And I said, I just quoted the Ramban. Then I would quote the Ramban. That's like the six days of our work week. So we're locked in. The six days of Genesis are 24 hours each. 24 hours each. But here's the, here's, here's the end. I'm the lucky, I'm the, I don't want to say lucky any longer because I was once on, on, on actually on Christian television, Pat Robinson. And he said, you weren't lucky. You were blessed. It's an important part of me for digressing totally. But a blessing isn't, oh boy, I'm blessed. Blessing's a gift. You didn't earn it. You didn't get it. You just got it. Okay? So I don't, I don't say I'm lucky, but I'll say I was lucky. But anyway, I was fortunate and I the, that I had both the science and the Bible. So, so the Ramban tells us, well, actually, yes, and then he answers, why does the text say, we hear the book of Yom Echad? Why does the text, why does the Bible write there was evening day, one day or day one? It doesn't say day two, it says Yom Shani, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, give me a first day. So why does it say day one? And he makes the most phenomenal statement. The Torah could not write a first day on the first day because there had not yet been a second day. And everyone knows that's the case. The first world war was not the first world war till the second world war came along. Right. And I give a personal example. I fought the first Lebanese war. None of my, none, not, not I, not my friends, nor my four buddies that didn't come back from the first Lebanese war didn't say we're fighting in the first Lebanese war. Why not? Because there wasn't yet a second Lebanese war. Now I have to say my kids when I talk the first Lebanese war. The Torah writes day one because the Torah is seeing time for the six days of Genesis from the beginning looking forward. They, that's the whole key, except it has no significance except the fact that we're an expanding universe. And among several sources, but the oldest one is the Rav Tanchuma on Parshat Savwe point, wording says, he brings out the whole discussion of the universe starting a tiny, a tiny point, expanding out. The only significance of the Ramban telling us, and he, then he says the universe started as a point not bigger than a grain of mustard. I bring the, the sources down in my book. It's not bigger than a grain of mustard. There was nothing. And then it was something that's very interesting. The physics today and these theories do not have a singularity at the beginning. A singularity is a point of zero space and infinite everything else, infinite temperature, because anything in zero space has to become infinite. Any number, as tiny as it is, divided by zero becomes infinite. And all the theories 
Although people casually say singularity, they don't really mean a singularity. They mean a tiny, tiny, tiny space, finite, which is exactly what the Ramban says, not bigger than a grain of mustard. Uh, uh, who, who, uh, is it like the black, not no bigger than the black of your eye, and it expands out and expands out. And that's that's the so we've always held by an expanding universe. And I presume the Ram, the Ramban knew that also, but once you have an expanding universe and you're seeing time, the Bible's point of view, this is not human point, is the Torah looking forward. Nowhere in the entire Tanakh is the passage of time said, he had evoker, there's evening, morning, and time. Evening is, is mentions of evenings and morning elsewhere, but never that couplet. He had a evoker, there's evening, morning. It is unique to Genesis chapter one. The description of time in Genesis chapter one is unique. And it's from the beginning looking forward. How do you know that? The Ramban told us, day one, not a first day. It wasn't a second day. So we're looking, so the Torah, from not a human point of view, from the Bible's point of view, it sees the Torah from the beginning looking forward. We look back, this, and it's the, from this huge universe that we live in, and we look back with our telescopes, etc., to see information from depth. And, and, and thanks to Hubble and uh, Henrietta Leavitt, whose name you never have heard, about, but look her up, there's no, Hubble tele, there's no Hubble telescope in the sky except for Henrietta Leavitt. And he put her up for a Nobel Prize and she died of cancer before she got it. Otherwise, there'd be a Leavitt, Henrietta Leavitt. Hubble telescope and she died of cancer before she can get the Nobel Prize. All of, her, all of his measurements are based on her insight, all of them. So we see light coming from deep space and we measure when it gets to us how much the wavelength has stretched because that light has to swim through space to get to us. But as it's coming to us from the deep space where the galaxy is far away, space is stretching, which no one understands what that means, but space is stretching. And and the light wave is stretched out. So we measure how much the light wave is stretched out from that galaxy and from that galaxy and from that galaxy. And, and it turns out when you unstretch the waves, it takes 14 billion years of travel to unstretch the waves. So that's how the age of the universe, the 13.8 billion is, is gotten with these days. So we live in a huge universe right now, right, huge. And those measurements are thousands of measurements do this, not doubling, but obviously thousands. So we live in the universe. And we look back, we, go, we look back in time, the universe isn't getting bigger. You know, it's mathematically, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not physically, big, but mathematically, as we look back in time, the universe is smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller back to day one. Now, we'll never know the size of the universe at its creation. That we'll never know. It's because the universe becomes opaque. And for many reasons, I'm not going to get into it. Or the plasma, and there's other the persons that persons that know this will not, you know, the listening will understand that if they're into this stuff. Otherwise, it's take it's okay. Which means you can't get information through it. But the Ramban tells us something ama amazing. He says, Hasman Nivra, creation, Hasman Nivra, time is created. And then he makes this magnificent nuance, which allowed me to make the calculation. He says, Aval. You can look at the Rambam, you'll find it on his commentary on Genesis chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. When you finally have yesh, matter, time grabs a hold. So he differentiates. Time is created at the creation. However, when you finally have matter, yesh, time grabs a hold. Why he understood that, I have no idea what he, what he was thinking. But the fact that he has a, had his student, Isaac of Acker, that made a calculation of a 15 billion year old universe makes me think that the Ramban knew something. I don't like to say Kabbalah because people think, you know, crazy Kabbalah. You know, I mean, it, Kabbalah's gotten out the best of names. <laughs> what's the first yes you have? In other words, what's the first piece of matter that identifies matter? It's called a proton. If I say and I have an atom with one proton, I'm saying I have hydrogen. If I say I have an atom with six protons, I'm saying I have carbon, eight protons, oxygen, 92 protons, probably it's uranium. Or in any event, that proton identifies the matter. That's the first yesh, mishi yesh. So time grabs a hold at that point. Before that time, time passed, but nothing was recording it because the energies were so high that nothing stable could exist. Anything that formed was smattered apart and, and light beams do not record time. At the speed of light, time doesn't pass. 
it passes rust. We know light travels in the sun. It takes eight minutes and 15 seconds. But if you flew on a, on a photon from the sun to the earth at the speed of light, your clock wouldn't even go tick or tock. Zero. Mm -hmm. in here. Clock begins here at the time the universe is like this, okay? And we're out here with the universe like this. What would happen if I had to squeeze this back? And what's amazing, it's one-on-one. One-on-one. -on -one. If I cut, as I go back in time and make the universe smaller and smaller, the passage of time becomes more and more compressed, more and more compressed. The way I describe it now, and I only, I, I, I've forgotten that I always did it, but the way I do it, had done it for decades and forgotten, I just came upon my papers again a month or two ago. Supposing I'm, supposing I'm here at the beginning, near the, with the first, at the beginning of the, of the Bible clock at the proton. The universe is this big. And I send, I'm going to send out a point every second, a, a, a bit, beep, a laser, beep, beep, beep. So every, there's, first beep goes out, and then it, it's traveling. It's, just, you know, it's a beep of light, it's a burst of light. It's not a, I'm not talking about sound, I'm talking about, you know, a laser, but let's just say beep. And then a second, and then a third, they're separate. But now as they travel in the universe for all these billions of years, what's the universe doing? It's expanding. So those beep, beep, beeps that were one second apart now become further and further apart because the time between them oh, wow. is become more and more and more. And it's, it's, it's such a graphic way of seeing it. And by the time you get to us, I can't get it on the screen, but it's, you know, it's like it's, it's stretched out by the average. If you go to my the papers, you'll see them. The average number is 900 billion. It's a, it's a moderate. It's a number that comes from the, the equations, which we're not going to get into the, the moment. But that, that means the ratio between our perception of time. Back here, the person said, if on each of those beeps of light, you can imprint information. That's how we're doing right now. Electromagnetic radiation is allowing us to do the zoom. You know, it's, it's imprint, imprint it. And if it says on each one, I'm sending you a well, beep every second, but by the time you get here, so it wouldn't be every second. No, it's, it's billions, it's gazillions of years or whatever it is between them. It's 900 billion seconds between them. Not every second, it's 900 billion seconds. That's the normal, I say that number, you have to go to the papers at h.com or wherever, or my website. Anyway, the 900 billion is, turns out to be, and it's all, and it's not relativity, I'm making it clear, it's astronomy, pure astronomy. But relativity allows this to be the case. That's you divide 14 billion years by 900 billion, you get the six days. I tell you, this, when I first did the calculation, I had no idea it was going to come out. And that number came out of the equation. First, I got scared as can be, and I ran to Barbara. I said, my wife, Barbara, I can't believe this. The six days are exactly what Chazal said. They are 24 hours each. Because that is the expansion factor of the universe. And when I take that expansion factor out, going back, 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 back in time, the 14 billion years become the six days. It's, uh, it's, it's easy to find exactly. Anyway, I've, I've taken up all your time, but okay. That's so, so then the, the other question was um, about the dinosaurs. Where do they fit in? Which is the fun. Oh, so, the, so now you've got plenty of the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs, remember on phase five, you got these tiny nimkadolim. The, one of the animals, and so it's the big debate, the tiny neem gadolim. It's the only animal, the only anything that has a size descriptor. No thing else, big, little, small, smart, dumb, but only the tiny neem get this tiny neem gadolim. So there's all kinds of understanding. King James called them whales, okay? King James called the whales because they're among aquatic animals, this is there. But the irony is, we know what tiny neem, we know what, well, first I'm going to do this from the Torah point, then from the eight, then from the time of where they fit in. But what, are the tiny, what, what does tiny mean? Well, let's see, Moses at the burning bush, God says to Moses, throw down a stick, I'll send you back, he throws a stick down and becomes a snake, right? A nachash. The Hebrew is important here, right? Become, everyone knows it means, it throws a stick, it becomes a nachash. Goes back to Pharaoh, meets up with his brother Aaron, they confront Pharaoh, now actually Aaron has the stick, he throws it down, Aaron says, show me a trick. He throws down the stick and it becomes a... Tanin. Yeah. Now we know it's the same phenomena because if, if it weren't if it weren't the same as there, then Moses would have said, "What are you giving me a, a, 
a whale in the King James. What do you give me a whale for? I wanted to, you know, get out of here already. You know, it would have really impressed Pharaoh. So we know that the Nachash and the Tanin are related because the stick becomes a Tanin. There's no reaction by Moses saying, I wanted a Nachash and he gave me a Tanin. So they have to be related. So what do we know about Nachash? What no about Tanin? No, excuse me. It becomes a... Have, yeah, it becomes a tanin, right? It becomes a tanin in front of Pharaoh. Okay. So the two means to be, to be together, that the tanin has to be, we know what nachash is, it's a snake. So, so tanin must be a general category, which, which includes snakes, because reptile. it... Hmm? Like a reptile. Yeah. Reptile. The big reptiles. Very interesting. Very interesting. Oh, but just one thing. Imagine if, imagine had, this is what's so amazing. If the Hebrew first translation had been faithful, the Arab, first Aramaic or the, the Septuagint, which went into Greek, right? If the Septuagint had been faithful to the Hebrew, and it was all by rabbis, but remember, they were trying to make the Bible compatible with Greek thought, so that you know there are, there are nuances. But how do you say big reptiles in Greek? Everybody knows the word. You know, Soros. Hmm. Oh, wow. means big or terrible. Soros means reptile. Can you imagine had they translated Tanin Gedolin, the Hebrew, because it's the Greek translation of Tuesday, it, there are two words for big. It didn't have to be Dino. So I'm picking the one thing I want. They would have had Dinosaurus, and there'd be no problem. 